I think at COP26, you've asked me specifically what we're going to do. And actually, yesterday, I was talking to, uh, I've spoken to the Seven Partnerships, Seven Trust, I've spoken to a, a collection of farmers. And yesterday, we were talking about actually the Seven Partnership and what we could be doing around the management of the, well, the longest river in England, the Seven, but of course, the catchment in Wales and our reservoirs and how we uh, mitigate both floods and droughts. Because what climate change is going to do, as you were alluding to, is make the extremes more likely. So it will make droughts more likely, it will make flooding more likely and more extreme. So we, we need to work to how we mitigate that, but how we mitigate that without affecting um, our rivers negatively, without affecting biodiversity negatively. Um, I'm very sceptical about a plan at the moment that involves um, a dam on, on uh, towards the Shrewsbury end. Um, and we are we are working, Philip Dunn, myself, Owen Patterson, uh, around the modelling of that, questioning the, the basic assumptions behind that. It's it very early days. So to be fair, the, the modelling is very um, um, uh, thin. <laughs> Let's put it like that. So what actually we were talking about was taking the kind of example of the seven from the source to the sea, how we want to manage our river and our water resource um, and manage the extremes in terms of the reservoirs as well, uh, to COP26, or at least make sure that around the fringes of COP26, the practical examples in the in you know, uh, industrialised, wealthy nation as ours are taking to do that. So I think if you're asking me specifically what I'll be doing, I think what Boris... Uh, and you asked me about Boris. Obviously, I'm not going to speak directly for him. But I was really, really pleased that Alok resigned as Secretary of State for Bays, which is a, a big job, and is specifically only looking after COP26. So that's a cabinet-level appointment just to do COP26. Uh, and he, 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 I know, having spoken to him, will be leading with his robust. And I think we can all um, take massive uh, enjoyment of President Biden's first... Uh, action and rejoining the Paris uh, Convention, so that, that that's that's good, of course. Yes, um, uh, you know we we um, so that's me specifically. That's Boris uh, priority for the government, and that's the COP twenty six. Uh, I know you had uh, you had a big run into that specific question about big issues, but I think I hopefully I answered your specific question. Um, and I presume this is a running order, so we've got Pam next. Yes, thank you, Craig. Um, my question is slightly more local than that, although it can affect the whole of the UK. It's a question about intensive farming, and in particular, you know, the way that we've been called the um, poultry capital of Wales, which is not very nice, not very conducive to attracting tourists. Now, um, I have various worries about this, uh, and a video I was watching recently was made in 2006, and it quoted the UN Food and Farming Organization saying, and I will quote them, um, it was a press release that said governments, local authorities and international agencies need to take a greatly increased role in combating the role of factory farming. So, you know, basically, it, this was about a uh, pandemic starting in intensive farming. And uh, so that's one of my big issues about intensive farming, the fact that it can be the source of pandemics. And we being the capital, poultry capital of Wales is one thing. Being the centre of the next pandemic will be quite another thing. And the other thing is antibiotics, the um, um, prophylactic use of antibiotics. Now, these are going to be banned in 2023 or 2022, I think, in the, in the EU. <laughs> one almost wonders, is that why we left or one contributory factor? Um, otherwise, our animals are going to end up being chlorinated. We are filthy and dirty and, you know, we don't, won't even need to import chlorinated chicken. We'll have our own. And the other thing is the fact that more than half the UK's chickens are produced by companies fully are partly controlled by US agribusinesses. So one recent a uh, application, um, the farmer was asked why he was doing it. And he said, well, you know, he couldn't make enough money out of beef and sheep. And one all really wonders why somebody who can't make money out of beef and sheep goes to a goes to a. Um, an aspect of farming he's never done before with a species he's never had before and expects to make money out of those when possibly the US company that's funding him will make more money. So I'd like to ask if you would please do something to have a moratorium on intensive farming, you know, UK wide, please, because it's our health, it's our health of our land, it's our health of our animals and 
you know, I'd like to hear your views on it, please. Thank you. Yep. No, well, uh, th my views on poultry farming, intensive poultry farming, are in the public domain. I'm not sure whether we've spoken about it before, uh, but Russell has pushed the Welsh Government to do planning guidelines for um, poultry, uh, intensive poultry farms, because currently there are no planning guidelines at the moment, so the local authorities are, are in a kind of open space. So that is happening, to be fair to the Welsh Government. There are, there are some planning guidelines coming. Uh, Janet and uh, you know around so I've, I've been working with the poultry farmers uh, around my anaerobic digester that mm. they're going to put in to deal with some of the waste there because of course they're looking at our rivers um, and you know my family uh, extended family farm the river Vernway so uh, the health of the river is incredibly close to my heart as I know it is all of yours uh, so poultry farming has a place the intensive poultry farming in a safe and open way especially to tackle antibiotic use uh, has a place but at the moment we are seeing proliferation on a, on a scale that isn't sustainable farmers recognize that as well as we uh, so we've asked the world government for uh, planning guidance for local authorities on the over concentration of these units that is coming um, I know Russell is pushing that as well so I with your next engagement with Russell perhaps you can ask him on the um, on the on the on the follow-up uh, but I'll certainly ask him again but that's that's where we are uh, I'm, I've, I've between I'm not sure we've again spoken about this about regenerative farming uh, and and the new kind of science coming out both out of the EU and us about how how we literally do farming um, and minimising antibiotic use like the EU have alluded to and that's in our statute at the moment as well. Uh, but I'll I'll pick it up and write to you about the antibiotic use and the 2023 deadline with the EU and what it means for us, uh, Pam. Who we go next, Julia. Right, thank you. Question. I'm afraid you're muted. Oops. <laughs> Please forgive me. No, no, no. Trust me, everyone, everyone does it. In these times of changing weather conditions and knowing how both drought and flooding can affect natural water flows in rivers, how can you see a sustainable river management in light of the many incidents that I will give reference to in the continuing examples? In August 2020, a catastrophic pollution incident killed thousands of fish and almost all of the aquatic wildlife of a picturesque and thriving Welsh Avon Clunvy at the northern end edge of Brecon Beacons National Park in what is just the latest of series similar incidents to affect Welsh rivers in recent years. Pollution and dead fish were first reported by local witnesses who reported an overpowering chemical smell along the river above Pontithel Bridge. Thousands of grayling, brown trout, bullheads, eels and minnows died. The river was also a stronghold for the endangered white-clawed crawfish, which are also reported to have perished. Due to low river flows, the pollution stayed in the water for longer and killed most of the invertebrate life, such as caddyfly and mayfly larvae that supported the fish populations. The same river also suffered a serious fish kill in 2016, but Natural Resource Wales could not accurately locate the source of the problem, so no one was prosecuted. And I've got lots of more examples, but I will go back to the... I've lived in Florida and I was witness um, to a scientist speaking about where rivers flow underground for many distances and they did a red dye experiment. He quoted, today's stormwater is tomorrow's groundwater. The problem is, while pollution of surfaces, surface waters are regulated, once it sinks into the ground beneath our feet, it seems to enter a twilight zone of regulation or lack thereof. This is clearly problematic. Consider the Santa Fe River disappears into the ground for 3.5 miles and reappears again in the Olano State Park. It is, is it not protected while it is flowing underground? And uh, that's my question to you. In these times of changing weather conditions, what can you see to help nature and the river all over the country, I suppose, when you ask the um, in Parliament? Well, you know, I'm slightly more positive about our rivers um, across the UK and, and specifically Wales. You know, there are instances, as you've alluded to, but both the Environment Agency and Natural Resources Wales are very quick 
to do thorough investigations and find out the sources of any uh, contaminant. And we are seeing healthier rivers. There's no question about that. Um, in terms of the seven partnerships, seven trusts, there's still a lot of work to do. And in um, across the border in uh, Ludlow's constituency, Philip Dunn, they've done a tremendous amount of work about removing um, historical man-made impediments to the river and reintroducing, restocking the fish. Um, and there's been some great biodiversity wins um, down the seven. That's clearly, we've got ma many more projects, many more millions to invest. But we, we are seeing some really good wins around our rivers. I know the licensing on underground water is getting ever tighter. Um, you just need to look at the um, uh, Montgomery Water and other companies that uh, take water extraction out of the ground. They are heavily licensed. They are heavily monitored. There's a lot of, so it's, I, I, I get your American example, but I don't know their regulatory framework, so I'm, I'm going to start commenting on it. Um, but in terms of the UK rivers, I am very pleased in the direction of the biodiversity change we're seeing. I'm very pleased in the quality of the water. I'm afraid I cannot promise this group or anyone else that there won't be instances around contaminants. Of course there are. To, to air is to, is to be human, and there will, there will, of course, be um, catastrophes that we don't want to happen. But, mm. you know, no regular re regulation, no licensing framework, no, can prevent everything. But, you know, overall, I'm, I'm pleased with the direction and I will continue championing the, the, um, the water quality in our rivers. But did you want to come back, Julie? Yes, thank yeah. you. That sounds very positive. It just states here that it will take 10 years to get the river back to the state it was before the latest pollution. But yeah. fortunately, fish and invertebrates exist in the upper catchment area. And it is hoped that within two years, fish may start appearing in the affected stretch of the river. I'm still yeah. concerned a lot about the... I know for a fact that there's a lot of pesticides and fertilisers that farmers put on the land. And that was the reason for that red dye test in Florida, because it showed you it flowing down from North Florida down into Mid Florida and the aquifer. Yeah. And how I mean, and, it, and it's a balance. You know, we, we've got a... We, we have a, a, an industry, farming, that we have especially locally that feeds a nation. Um, um, it's a balance between uh, the, the regulatory frameworks that keep our farmers mm. uh, profitable and the, our environment. Uh, I think the balance is about right in this country at the moment. Thank you. Uh, next, we've got Ian. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, uh, with COVID, uh, we have seen uh, an exodus of both people and businesses from city centres. Now, obviously... We don't know if that's going to continue. But one of the positives of it uh, is that it has opened up the potential for our city centres to be less busy and less congested, which we know, of course, cause tremendous levels of pollution and can obviously seriously hurt our country's biodiversity. Uh, I know Boris Johnson uh, relatively recently announced the Green Recovery Plan, uh, which included you know, many good things, to be fair. Um, however, it didn't include, didn't comment on the goal of transforming our congested and highly polluted city centres into green gardens and creating green spaces. Mm. And France, I think it was toward the end of last week, uh, pledged 200 million euros to transform Champs-Élysées into uh, a green nature reserve, um, helping encourage biodiversity and assisting our for a clean environment in general, uh, also cleaner air, etc. Uh, and I know the Conservatives have made some pledges in this area, and I think in the 2019 manifesto did encourage uh, green spaces. Uh, but with your party, obviously now what's going to be a huge challenge in overcoming uh, you know, the, the, the economy, the, the, the recession, etc. Uh, would it encourage the introduction of substantial green areas, green gardens and nature reserves in our cities uh, to help encourage biodiversity and allow for you know, a true green renewal? And I know... Um, the growing Newtown project. Uh, I think Newtown, along with Paris County Council, have secured quite a bit of money to reinvest uh, or to invest in measures to make the town greener. Uh, so I guess my question is pretty much what are your thoughts, and I guess the Conservative Party's thoughts, on making our towns um, and cities uh, full of green spaces um, and nature reserves to uh, help biodiversity and our environment in general? You know, I suppose the short answer is yes. Um, I think there's been a lot of promises around this. And I think if you look at the investment that um, the Prime Minister and the government made straight away into cycleways, um, you know, that, that's key for getting um, 
both uh, the urban traffic um, and a more uh, open green, sustainable transport route for our city centres. You know, cy- cy- cycle paths, cycle ways, safe ways to cycle clearly make a massive impact on urban urban transport. Um, you know, COVID has has also been uh, a nightmare for public transport as well. You know, we we need to find a way of socially distancing while having a movement of millions of people. You know, nowhere is that a better example than London, the underground. It is extremely difficult, as you would have seen on your news channels, to socially distance <laughs> while cramming into a tube. Um, we've also seen massive steps forward in battery technology, hydrogen propulsion. Uh, in Clandred and Wells, not far from here, they finally rolled out their exemplar, uh, their first model of a hydrogen car. So, you know, we, we also need to balance on what we think urban transportation will look like soon. Um, if you start getting cars where the only uh, the only consequence of their 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 their, their, their transcourse through the city is water out of the back rather than um, the pollution we currently see out of cars. Well, actually, that brings car back front and centre, um, obviously. So you need, you need a balance. So look, we've, we've been pretty good, and as you've alluded to the manifesto and some of the statements, the government and money the government's come out with since since uh, the Prime Minister took over and since the 2019 election on planning and on the green, healthy lungs of our urban environment as well as different ways of transport. But you alluded to at the beginning of the difficulties of COVID. They brought in a, a, a dynamic to public transport we didn't we didn't fully um, understand before. Um, and also how that operates, how we were pushing a modal shift from people out of cars onto buses, onto trains, onto undergrounds. But of course, people don't feel safe on buses, on trains, on the underground anymore. So that modal shift becomes a lot more difficult because people have retreated to their cars and currently cars are dirty you know they 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 hurt the environment they don't help um but equally you need to, as we've spoken about many many times in this call if you don't have the electorate and the people behind change it becomes very very much more difficult nigh impossible uh who we got next it's uh david <laughs> Right, I've unmuted myself. How about that? You're a pro. Well, they did. You sp- Pam, David, you probably spent your lives on Zoom. I've certainly seen you a lot. Go on. Yes, it, it does seem like we did go to bed occasionally, but enough about that. <laughs> I, I've actually got as serious a question as any of the others, but they don't relate directly to um, climate change. Um, but in a sense, uh, climate change is a. Um, is a component of, of the worries associated with, um, with, with nuclear weapons. Now, tomorrow, uh, on the 22nd of January, the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which has been um, proposed and promoted by the UN, that comes into force in the sense that um, of the, the 51 countries that have signed up to it, um, will be observing the treaty. Um, interestingly, nearly all of the countries that have signed up to it are in what we tend now to call the Global South, um, what we used to politically incorrectly call the underdeveloped world. Um, but generally they are in this, the, the, or even the third world. Thanks, man. Um, but they are generally in the southern hemisphere, so yep, the, um, that, that does obtain. Um, so I've got two questions uh, relating to the fact that the UK isn't a signatory to this um, um, nuclear weapons treaty. Uh, and the two questions are, why not? Well, that's a fairly simple question. I mean, clearly the government must have a a defence policy which rests on nuclear weapons and I think my question relates to why and the second thing is the cost of keeping up our nuclear arsenal in good shape and ready to use and replacing whatever we have at the moment with things like Trident is going to cost a lot of money a lot of money, even against the figures that um, are being put around now in terms of um, economic recovery and um, 
the 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 the, the amounts of money that are paid to people because of COVID right now. You 